What up, gang? This Ken Zerk, Ken Zilling, and Zika Milling, and the villain for the and we are back on Umi Naka no Naku Koro Ni. Last episode, shit happened. My goat is dead. My goat is dead. Kanon might also be dead. We aren't sure, but that nigga got stabbed in his shit. Uh, fuck, man. Ava and Hideyoshi is dead as fuck. In the end, Kanon did not regain consciousness. I guess he's dead. Fuck. Does it like, does it show that now? Like, is he officially dead? Damn. Found in the boiler room with the weapon resembling an ice pick sticking out his chest. How presumptuous of lowly furniture. Damn. Damn. So Kanon is actually fucking dead. That's wild. Even though Dr. Nanjo and the rest did all they could to heal him. Of course, there was very little that could be done on an island like this without medicine or proper facilities. However, Kanon was the only human ever to confront the culprit. If only he could have gave us some kind of clue. However, at the time they carried Kanon away, it was already too late. My sincere apologies. Without proper facilities, there was nothing I could do about such a serious wound. No, that's perfectly understandable. Thank you so much for giving it your best. Dr. Nanjo's shirt had been sprayed by a violent spurt of blood, so it was easy to imagine a devotion with which he had tried to save Kanon's life up until the last second. Jessica was crouched in the corridor, crying softly. She had probably been taking care of Kanon until the very moment of his death. George tried to approach her with words of comfort, but when Jessica pushed him away, he stopped trying to force her to talk and left her alone. If only I hadn't let Kanon get a go alone. Oh. Do not let that bother you. If you had been with him, you would probably would have been attacked as well. He foolishly rushed on ahead and paid for his mistake. How can you say it like that? Kana spotted the culprit and bravely stood up to them. If only Kumasawa had gone with him, the Pope might have hesitated and chosen to run away. Emotion filled words that I never thought I'd hear coming from Jessica's mouth tumbled out. Kumasawa, looking truly sorry, could do nothing but hang her head. Jessica, you shouldn't talk to her now. It's the same for me and probably you as well, right, Badalyn? We don't know what's going on, and it feels like our hearts are going to be split open. There were tears in George's eyes again. Seeing Jessica break down crying probably brought back the pain of losing his parents. I'd done my crying all at once, so I didn't feel like crying anymore. However, I understood how great the pain in their hearts were. It's okay, Jessica. You'll be able to meet Kanon again soon. Stop it! I don't need you trying to console me like that. Beatrice will resurrect the dead and even love that has been lost. So you'll definitely be able to meet him again soon. Then everyone will be able to live in peace. So the one who killed Kanon is his Beatrice, who supposedly gave you that letter yesterday. Where is she? Where is she hiding? I'll find her and tear her apart! Tell me! You know what the culprit is, don't you? What are you knowing? What are you hiding? Tell me, damn it! Milady, please stop. Beatrice exists! Exists! Damn it, let go of me, Genji! Maya knows what the culprit is! And she's hiding their identity even though she knows it! She must be telling them what we're doing, guiding them to let it kill us! Jessica, be silent! Jessica grabbed at Maria. Genji tried to stop her, but Jessica could not be calm. The next thing I heard was the sound of Aunt Natsuki slapping Jessica's face. Damn, slap the fuck out that bitch. After that, Jessica's sorrowful, sobbing voice resounded throughout the hall. Maria, Maria. I know there's no way you're the culprit. You've been with us since the beginning, and there's no, there was no time for you to communicate with any culprit. 
So I want you to tell me something. This Beatrice who handed you the letter yesterday, who was she? Although those words seem kind, they clearly showed that George still had some remaining doubts about Maria. He didn't actually grab at her. However, he felt exactly the same way Jessica did. Aniki, I already asked her the same thing a second ago. Her answer was the same as before. I want to hear it from Maria's mouth. Who is Beatrice? Even if I told you, you wouldn't believe anyway. What do you mean by that? Could it be the culprit someone we know well? And you're keeping silent because you're covering for them for some reason. Who gave you that letter? I got it from Beatrice. I'll say it no matter how many times you ask. I got the letter from Beatrice. George, do you refuse to believe in Beatrice because she's not an opponent you can hit? You want to turn your feelings of helplessness into violence and beat someone up. So you won't be satisfied unless your opponent is a human you can hit. So even if I tell you the truth, you won't accept it. So it's pointless for me to tell you. You won't believe it. But I'll keep on saying it. Because it's true. Beatrice exists. The door to the Golden Land will soon be open. I'll go there. Beatrice promised. In that world, Mama is nice. Papa's with us and is also nice. I want to go there right away. Everyone is afraid of Beatrice. But that's only natural. So calm yourself. Beatrice says so herself. By the time the typhoon has passed, I'll have ended everything, she said. Ouch. Maria, I don't mind you being talkative, but let's leave it at that for now. I bet this has been a pretty happy situation for you, since you're always going on about how witches exist, but keep that to yourself for now. Don't try to force that on other people. I know I've been creeped out by this girl for a while now, but there really is something wrong with her. Don't you think so too, Battler? Genji? Kumasawa? What about you, Ma? Maria knows what the corporate is and she's hiding it. Okay, maybe she hasn't done anything directly. But she's definitely working with the criminal. That's right, she's a spy. We can't let her stay with us any longer. Maria, you must realize there are times when indiscreet discussion is best avoided. If you keep adding oil to the father, even if you keep adding oil to the fire, even now will get very angry. Uh, not so we glared at Maria with frightening eyes. Maria was used to Aunt Rosa's loud style of scolding, but she apparently hadn't built up any resistance to Aunt Natsui's quiet sort of scolding. She shrugged and kept her mouth shut. A, 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 a desolate feeling filled the room. It felt as though things would get more complicated if anyone spoke. How many people have already died? Six people in Dad's group. After that, Aunt Ava, Uncle Hideyoshi, Kanon, Grandfather. That's ten niggas, bro. There was a whole 18 people on this island, supposedly, and ten of those people have been killed. That's more than ha half of us. And right now, there's absolutely no proof that the remaining eight people will be safe. At any rate, this is no time to quarrel. Now that we are certain the culprit can enter and leave the mansion at will and strike out of nowhere, we must give our undivided attention to surviving until tomorrow. I agree strongly with Aunt Natsu. We can figure out who the culprit is at our leisure tonight. For now, though, we're better off finding a place to barricade ourselves in. As I said this, I pointed out the clock to everyone. It was already 8 at night. I've been receiving shocks over and over again since the early morning, and our bodies and minds were both completely tired out. There's still a long, long time until tomorrow. We needed to find some place to barricade ourselves in so we could rest our bodies and get even the smallest amount of relief. 
I agree. Everyone is already pushing their mental and physical limits, myself included. I believe it would be wise to take that into account as we move forward. That's right. There's a high probability that the enemy's got the equivalent of a master key. Was Shannon, Kanon, and Goda holding master keys? Yes. They were supposed to have them on that person during work. We didn't want to disturb the scene, so we didn't investigate that closely. We can't eliminate the possibility of someone that someone stole a key from them. In the first place, we know the culprit may have visited the servant room at some point to unlock the garden shed shutter. It's conceivable that they obtained the master key from there early on. There were many servants serving the Ushirimiya family. Because of that, there were several master keys. Furthermore, every time one employee started or finished working, the keys were passed between servants. And we had to acknowledge that this had probably gotten a bit sloppy at times in the past. Even if they borrowed a bundle of keys from the pockets of one of the murdered servants, is there any place that even those keys couldn't open? Because of the nature of our job, we have been entrusted with keys to all of the rooms, all of them in the mansion and in the guest house. So in other words, no matter where we hold up and lock ourselves in, it just be pointless. Fine, who cares about locking up? If you're gonna come, bring it on, damn it! Go into Kenzo's room! I'll beat you at your own game! The enemy won't approach us from the front. I don't know about the first six, but if we look at what happened to my parents and Kanon, and even grandfather, the enemy has only gone at their isolated people. They don't have the power to assault all of us openly in a secure room. That's right. It's just like Anaki says. And maybe Aunt Natsui's rifle can serve as a deterrent to stop them from attacking. I hope that is so, but... Maria, I know you want to say something, but shut the fuck up for a while. Maria probably wanted to say something about how witches weren't afraid of guns. But if she were to say it out loud, the atmosphere around here would start to get pretty edgy. I had noticed and decided to put a stop to it. If I may, I do know of just one place that cannot be entered, even with the servant ring key rings. Where is that? That would be the master's study. Uh, I'm against this. I don't even want to think about going into grandfather's creepy room. How many keys can gain access to that room? There are two. I always have one on my person. The other is held by the master himself. But just now, I found this on the corpse in the boiler room. Genji took out a handkerchief out of his pocket and opened it, showing us the burnt and filthy study key. Then he showed it alongside his own key, which he had once lent to Natsuhi. Normally, it would have been proper to leave the master's key for the police. But because of the master's order to protect the safety of the study, I borrowed it for the time being. I see. Which means that Kenzo's study is the only place where we can be safe. It would appear that way. I don't even want to think about being shut up in that strange room all night. But it appears we must acknowledge that his room is safer than anywhere else right now. Even though Grandfather locked himself up in that safe room, the culprit brought him out and killed him. We can't be certain that it's truly safe. According to your theory, Grandfather cleverly found a way around the receipt trick and left the room of his own free will. If so, the room might be a good place to barricade ourselves in after all. You're too optimistic, Aniki. However, at the same time, I thought it brought up a pretty interesting point. After all, this gave us the, the chance to question the enemy, the witch herself about how the sealed door had been opened. If we assume the culprit used some technique to kidnap Grandfather from his study, they'd have to show us the same trick again if they wanted to assault us in the study. 
and that give us a chance to make the culprit prove how they did it right before our eyes. If she's really a witch, we'll be forcing her to use her little magic trick to open the door right in front of us. But that's probably impossible. If you spin the chessboard around, it's obvious the culprit is acting in a way that'll make us think that they're, they're a witch. Battler. Battler. Look. Look, he's stronger than me. Because at this point, I would have laid down. I would have been like, all right, we're dealing with a witch. Make it quick, bitch. Make it quick, witch, bitch. Make it quick. Make it quick. <laughs> yeah, you, you can snap your fingers and blow my fucking skull up. Yeah, I, I'm sure you can. Just go in and do it. Don't waste my fucking time. Don't do that. Just don't waste my fucking time. Just kill me. Get the shit over with. Make it painless. <laughs> if she really is a witch, all she got to do is appear in front of us and wow us with a colorful display of magic. Since she's avoided doing that, everything must be the work of a fake witch who wants us to think that she's real. Therefore, a culprit who used a technique other than magic to defeat the closed room couldn't open the door before our eyes. Is grandfather's room big enough to stuff eight people in? Yes. There is a bed, a sofa, and blankets. So while it is not luxurious, it will be more than suitable for spending the night. There is also a sink, a bathroom, a refrigerator, and a liquor cabinet. Whoa, that's incredible. But isn't that weird? You're saying you built another house inside his house. That's pretty cramped for the last house of somebody like our grandfather, who bought a whole island and realized all his dreams. That's right. After some point in time, father probably couldn't feel at peace in any other place, even inside his mansion. We always sneered about how he shut himself up in there. And this time, we're the ones who are going to shut ourselves up. <laughs> Jessica spat the words out. Jessica, sounds like you'd rather go search for the culprit than stay shut up somewhere. Of course. I don't think we'll be able to find them if we just start searching on our own. In the end, we can't do anything but wait. Then it doesn't matter where we wait, does it? I'm not gonna run away or hide. Why don't, why don't we just take it easy in the parlor watching TV or something while we wait for Beatrice to appear? It's perfectly fine if she doesn't appear. There's no need for us to be the ones to expose the culprit. Well said. We shouldn't take needless risks before the police arrive. Thank you, Dr. Nanjo. I think we should move to Father's study. True, we have no proof that it's safe, since Father was taken out of there. However, we can't deny the possibility that, as battle of reason, Grandfather left the study of his own accord and was attacked outside. A while back, I proposed that strange Gary as a stopgap measure. But just as Aunt Ava said, even though the trick was be plausible, possible, I couldn't explain what motive could have made Grandfather sneak out of his own study into the troublesome way. Plus, Grandfather couldn't have even used that trick unless he knew that the receipt was wedged in the door. Aunt Ava hadn't pointed out that last part, but it's clear how absurd the theory was. So does that mean the sealed door formed the closed room just as Aunt Ava claimed? Is it an undeniable fact that Aunt Natsuhi was the culprit? If Aunt Ava were here now, She'd probably make that claim openly and blow my strange theory away. But anyway, I had to admit that a room with both a bed and a toilet that all eight people could be shut up in, and with only two keys, both of which were gathered here, had to be the safest place in the mansion right now. At the very least, I figured this would be better than just staying shut up in the parlor, hoping nothing will go wrong. Wait. Have we been safe only because we've been shut up in the parlor? What if leaving that room and moving to an unexplored location is actually more dangerous? Ah, it's useless, it's useless, it's all useless. Our flimsy head is about to break out in a fever. If I keep spinning the chessboard around, right and wrong will keep switching places over and over and I won't be able to believe anything. When it seems like the culprit is one of the 18, I want to believe in Beatrice. Once I start believing in Beatrice, I start, I start wanting to find the culprit and admit the 18. If that keeps spinning around forever, if that keeps spinning around forever, in the end, my thoughts won't have taken one step from where they started. 
Just keep thinking, little guy. How far back in the past was it that Kyrie taught me about chessboard thinking? That concept of examining the situation by spinning it around and thinking from the enemy's side. I seem to remember being so interested by it back then, I used it to guide all my thinking. By that way, Kyrie was dad's co-worker. By the way, Kyrie was dad's co-worker back then. I never dreamed that she'd someday be added to our family. Didn't Kyrie tell me something once? I get the feeling she once said that while this chessboard thinking was one way to look at things, it certainly wasn't all powerful and it wouldn't be good to rely on it too much. Chessboard thinking is my own interpretation of something called game theory which I read about in a book long ago. It's a very interesting subject, so you should tackle it yourself when you get into college, battler. I really want to try it. If I could study and perfect my chessboard thinking, it'd be fun to read into my enemy the, my opponent's moves, wouldn't it? But you can't believe in it blindly. Game theory is very deep and complicated subject. Chessboard thinking is just my interpretation that skims the surface of game theory. In order to thoroughly read your opponent's moves like you're imagining, you need to study your opponent. Additionally, while chessboard theory is a convenient and practical, it isn't perfect. It has many weak points despite its convenience. Weak points. Yes. Chessboard thinking is founded upon game theory. When you thoroughly investigate game theory, it boils down to math. Do you know where the weak point in math is? It's noise. In math, when you write 1 plus 1 equals 2, that process will always result in 1 plus 1 equals 2, no matter how many billion years pass. Nothing more, nothing less. That's because there's absolutely no noise mixed in. But for example, unlike math, the Japanese language has noise mixed in. Kanji are a good example. Old kanji and new kanji are slightly different, which represents an introduction of noise created by the changes between time periods. Isn't history the same? There are dozens of policies that seem foolish in the modern era, but were meaningful at some point in the past. Because the rules of chess are fixed, when a pair of experts are discussing one particular layout, it's possible they could reach the same conclusion whether they are a hundred years in the past or a hundred years in the future. However, if the rules of chess had gone through massive changes over time, it's possible that a discussion about the same layout would have changed as well. That's right. If events, in the, in the events in the world of humans are normally full of noise. Aren't human emotions that way? Even if the same exact thing occurs more than once, there's no guarantee that humans will always act in a predictable, in a predictable fashion. The moment we try to use math-based theory to predict someone's actions, we must be aware that our theory has built-in weaknesses and limits. Simply put, chessboard thinking is extremely weak against noise and fickleness, as well as mistakes or, or incorrect knowledge. That makes a lot of sense. You know, they say like when, when it comes to fighting games or games in general, you no, know, when it comes to like a lot of fighting games and shit, the hardest people to beat are people who don't know what the fuck they're doing. Because as a professional player, you're used to reading your opponents, you see who they play, you get a bit of their play style and you know what they're gonna do next. But a, a beginner does not know what the fuck is going on. Like it's incorrect knowledge. They don't know what the fuck is going on. They're just fucking up doing dumb shit and then you end up getting your ass beat because you're, because you're treating them like a pro player. That's right. Kyrie definitely said that. Chess has always been a game where both sides play the same rules and fight with the same conditions for victory. That's why it's possible for both sides to predict the other's moves. It's possible to read your opponent because you can always suppose they'll make the best moves they can find. But what if your opponent is fickle or a bit tired and makes a move that can hardly be called the best? Or what if this game actually has a special rule? Someone, some unknown thing that only the enemy knows about and can use. In fact, what if the enemy, what if the opponent has some goal other than victory? Think from your enemy's perspective. That's the basis of chessboard thinking, which means if you misread your enemy, the answer you draw from this process will be complete rubbish, useless. 
So far, I've used chessboard theory to get several vague bits of information about the culprit hiding behind this case, or so I think. However, I don't know anything about the culprit. Am I just playing around in a labyrinth of thought? If Kiri over here at a time like this, she'd probably be able to notice something with her much, much sharper thinking ability. Until the very last moment, Jessica resisted moving into Grandfather's study. But in the end, Aunt Natsu, he persisted, and we decided to move there. Everyone was completely wrapped in paranoia by now. Kumasawa had prepared dinner at one point, but during the time we were discovering the deaths of George, both the kitchen and the parlor had been left empty. Someone suggested that the food might have been poisoned while we were gone. Because of that, we were unable to even touch the food that Kumasawa had taken the trouble to make for us. The manner in which the first six were killed was still unknown, but it certainly could have been poison. Certainly, that would allow even a single person to carry out the murder of six large adults. Furthermore, this idea made it, made it easy to imagine that there's only a single culprit, one who'd be afraid of Anatsuki's rifle. And this was very good for our emotional stability. But the fatigue and hunger were even harsher than we'd imagined. Then Kumasawa made a proposal when y'all went together to the kitchen. There we gathered some canned food and other things that'd be hard to poison and take in with us. All of Kumasawa's efforts to reward us with just a little dinner on this savage day regrettably came to nothing. The food piled up on a serving cart looked just a little sad. We all started climbing the stairs. Aunt Natsuhi, who was in a lead, warily stared into the darkness with both eyes in the barrel of the gun. Once we dragged ourselves up to the dirt floor, just as Aunt Natsuhi had warned ourselves beforehand, there was a mixture of a chemical smell and a sickly sweet aroma, a stench hanging in the air that felt like it was eating into our heads. I see. This kind of stench probably would give you a headache if you were shut in with it for a whole night. I know it's a little late, but I'm a Jessica. I vote against going into this nigga study. It felt like the stench was floating out from this magnificent door. It was a door to the forbidden study, which would defend against any who would enter. While Genji unlocked the door, Maria stared at the door and the doorknob with great interest. Incredible door. It looks old and strict, like it stopped any jokes cold. A perfect door for grandfather's study. The power to ward off spiritual menaces is strong here. Beatrice probably couldn't open this door. Hmm? What does that mean? Mario pointed at the doorknob. A scorpion crest. No, a design like a magic circle arranged around a scorpion was inscribed there. That design, that's right. Isn't it just like those keychain charms Mario gave Jessica and me yesterday? The fifth magic circle of Mars is a strong ward against magic. Additionally, this magic circle was very diligently constructed and is full of power. Such a magic circle can be quite troublesome to beings of magic like Beatrice. Isn't that comforting? Are you saying we can escape even Beatrice's clutches in this room? Our little witch here sure is reliable. Then how did Beatrice get Grandfather out? Just as battle of reason. Beatrice can't go inside. However, she has both magic and familiars. Using them, she might have been able to get Grandfather to leave the study of his own accord. Uh, I've read about that in manga. I've seen a bunch of scenes where vampires are frightened of crosses so they couldn't get close. But the familiars were just fine so they made the familiars attack. Those scorpion keychains I gave you, yesterday also had the fifth magic circle of Mars on them. The power dwelling within them was weak, but they shouldn't be enough to protect you until we leave this island. Although it sounds like you've lost yours, right? Scorpion keychains. Yeah. The charm I gave you yesterday was something I got from Maria. I heard it will repel magic if you put it on your doorknob and 
at the time I thought maybe it'd be better if you had it. Is that so? I thought it was an odd thing for you to be carrying around. Uh, Natsu, he put that on her doorknob? Yes. Last night, after hearing about it from Jessica, I hung it from the doorknob on the inside of my door. Then, not Natsu, he, you're really fortunate. If you did that, Beatrice probably couldn't lend a finger on you today, on yesterday. I think Beatrice must have been really annoyed. <laughs> Beatrice annoyed. Couldn't lay one finger. Not until we thought back on that eerie scribble she'd seen that morning. As though someone had been tearing at the outside of her door with blood-soaked hands and gasping surprise. Could it be that this witch who called herself Beatrice tried to enter through the door to Natsui's own room? with the magic repelling charm that had been hanging from the inside. So she couldn't break through the door. So she was annoyed. So she scratched at him. Quit it, don't talk about that. Witches don't exist. The culprit does. And there are humans just like us. If you need proof, why don't we dice her up and see if her blood's red? Damn it, damn it! How could you do that to Kana? Damn, bitch, did you have a crush on him or some shit? Genji unlocked the door. Eight people entered Kenzo's study. And there goes Kenzo inside of there. I'm calling it. No, I'm not calling it. That was just a dumbass joke. Why did I say I'm calling it like I actually believe that dumb shit? Grandfather's study. I'd heard rumors about it beforehand, so I wasn't that shocked. He had nothing more than fort he had nothing more than fortify it thoroughly. He had done nothing more than fortify it thoroughly with his occult hobbies. And grandfather's hobby was had been chasing after pop idols. These walls might have been buried beneath idol posters. Even if I didn't understand it, I did realize that this room was a bundle of his pastimes. Even so, I couldn't help but remain dumbfounded by the smell of this, his creepy medicine and the sweet stench that seemed to melt my head. When the door was closed, it automatically made a clunk. I see. This is the auto lock that's activated whenever the door is closed. And there were only two keys that could enter this door from the outside, both of which were in this room. In other words, it had become a closed room. The shire, the receipt, the cha chain, and now the auto lock. This fourth door had the most magnificent lock yet, and this was doubtlessly a closed room. Just to make absolutely sure that the room was secure, we checked all over for a ways in or out. The window was tightly locked. That should have been enough, but just in case we tried knocking all knock, knocking all the wall knocking all over the walls. After all, we had talked about there being a hidden door in this room, but we couldn't find anything suspicious. Grandfather's study was very large. Even though we called it a study, it wasn't really a single room. It could be divided up into four basic sections: a study section, a bathroom, a bedroom section, bathroom section and a section for cooking that had a sink. I see. This study really does have enough in it to live in. Now I see how Grandfather could live his whole life in this room without ever leaving. It seemed Grandfather wasn't in the habit of watching TV because there was no television or even a radio in this room. We can't do anything except pass the time listening to the sound of the rain until tomorrow morning. Dr. Nanja looked closely at the chessboard that sat on the sofa in front of the that sat on the table in front of the sofa and muttered. It was apparently the partly finished chess match that he'd been playing with grandfather until yesterday. The black had the white pretty well cornered, and it looked like checkmate would be reached within a few moves, the last part of the end game. Even though checkmate had almost been reached, the end game had been rushed, and in the end was never completed. Kinzo, it seems... You weren't able to see this match through after all. Dr. Nanjo. 
I was Kinzo's friend for a long time, but I never knew about more than half of him. I believe two Kenzos existed, a wise one and one trapped by some madness. I never understood anything about him. Especially when it came to Beatrice, it would seem like his personality changed. In the direction of Kumasawa's upward gaze, a portrait of Beatrice could be seen. It wasn't massive like the one hanging in the entrance hall, but small, made for this room. Grandfather probably spent every day in this room, and so much of his time, talking to the witch in that portrait. Who was Beatrice to grandfather in the first place? Right now, you could have just explained it away by saying it was a story made by the parents of some, made by the parents of frightening some children away from wandering into the forest. While eating the canned food we brought from the kitchen, we talked together about who Beatrice was. Whether the culprit was Beatrice herself or someone pretending to be her. Whether they were a witch or a human, that was all besides the point. The woman in this portrait was strongly related to the roots and background of this case. You couldn't talk about this case without talking about her. Read the damn note! I'm waiting for y'all to read the fucking note! That's right! Mom, you picked up the Cobra's letter in Aunt Ava's room, right? Thank you! I've been sitting here the whole fucking time thinking, like, when are they gonna read the fucking note? My goodness! Yes. I still haven't opened it. Let me give- let's give it a try. Uh, now we took out the western envelope. Genji pulled a paper knife out of the drawer in the study desk and handed it to her. While watching her open it, George grimaced slightly. After all, there was a letter left at the site where his parents had been murdered. There was a good chance his conscience would say something unbearable to Anaki. Uh, not so we seemed to realize that. So she glanced over the contents first without reading it aloud. We were a little frightened that she might grimace after reading something shocking, but she just frowned unhappily. No, you are. What does it say? There is one unpleasant sentence. It must be trying to provoke us. Anatsui, after deciding that the contents could be shown to the children, set it openly on the table. Everyone stared at it at the same time. Praise my name. What the hell? That's annoying. It's probably Beatrice declaring herself the victor. Damn it. I bet you were hoping for another weird magic circle would show up. It wasn't a magic circle, but my expectations haven't been betrayed. What could it mean? I wonder if she wants to tout her own existence. That seems reasonable. With this letter, we now know that the author of last night's letter is the culprit. I think the identical envelope is more significant than what's written here. Without a doubt, this is the type of envelope and sealing wax that the master used. I don't know what's going on anymore. This is the first time I've seen anything like this since I started working for the Ushirimiya family. Going by last night's letter, Beatrice is claiming to be grandfather's oldest confidante. Grandfather often said the same thing in the past, right? I spoke to Genji and Kumasawa who nodded together. Guess that means you two know more about her than anyone except grandfather. Could you tell us? For a long time, I've purposely avoided this topic. But now that it has come to this, I can no longer do so. Genji, tell us everything you know. Genji didn't answer. Did he remain silent despite his knowledge, or did he not know any or did he know anything? Or did he know nothing at all? Still, I had a good guess. The ghost story of the witch Beatrice had long been defiled defied among the servants. Long been deified among the servants. He had probably been very close to grandfather and his occult hobbies. So there was a good chance that he'd been indoctrinated with even weirder things and had increasingly come to deify the witch. As grandfather's most trusted servant who had sworn loyalty to him, he might be the most influenced by the illusion of the witch that grandfather had created. 
that there was only one reason for Genji to remain silent. He could speak, but it would definitely cause a backlash. So it was better if he kept his mouth shut. It wasn't like we believe him anyway. Something along those lines. A short while ago, Maria had been more than willing to speak bluntly and unrestrainedly, and that had earned her a scuffle with Jessica. It was natural for Genji to keep his silence. Was she father's concubine? His concubine? That could be possible. For ordinary poor people, polygamy isn't only viewed negatively from a moral perspective. For polygamy is, maybe, I don't know. It's also an unmaintainable financial si Oh, yeah, 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 isn't. It's also an unmaintainable financial situation. But that isn't the case for the very rich. It's possible for them to have another lover in addition to their real wife. We can't deny the possibility that grandfather had another woman in his life besides grandmother. Maybe. When grandmother was alive, I hear she was pretty sure of it. She thought he was cheating on her. I always thought she meant grandfather's imaginary witch. Now this is getting really interesting. You told me, didn't you, Genji? You said Beatrice has been working for grandfather since before the mansion was finished. I hear that the construction of the mansion was completed in Showa 27, 1952. That means this person called Beatrice was in a relationship with grandfather since at least 30 years ago. And that concubine of 30 years, or maybe a relative or hidden child of that person, with that person, hold some kind of grudge and be planning revenge? I see. This is starting to sound like your standard Western mansion mystery. It's a filthy topic, but the easiest line of reasoning to accept. What do you think, Genji? The master surely had deep... The master surely had feelings of deep love for her. There can be no mistake that he cared for her more than his late wife. Who is this person called Beatrice? And what is she doing now? I have heard that she passed away before the mansion was completed. She's already dead. Yes. The master was deeply stricken by grief at her loss, and he devoted himself to the art of black magic as a means to revive her. The master loved Beatrice from the bottom of his heart. It was that madness which drove him to do all that you see here. As Genji said this, he spread his arms, as though asking us to look at this room filled with signs of grandfather's madness. We were all at a loss for words. Normally, black magic seems like it'd just be creepy, and it's really hard to imagine why someone would be so enraptured by it. Since Kenzo was just an eccentric who had restored through Shiramiya family and missed his madness, nobody had tried to understand him. The only thing on grandfather's mind had been the loss of a beloved woman and his inescapable sorrow. Earlier, this room had seemed creepy, but in an instant, he had changed into something we could understand completely. The creepy books, the magic circles, the medicine, all of it. It all existed simply because he wanted to revive the face of a single woman who had left this world over 30 years ago. The master only told me, of me about Beatrice's story once when he was very drunk. Although I have forgotten the details, it was a deep, deep love, enough to make a woman like me jealous. When Kenzo succeeded the headship of the Oshiramiya family, his marriage to his late wife had already been decided by the few surviving family members. So, he was forced into a marriage with some woman who would benefit the Oshiramiya family. 
That is correct. Kenzo was installed as the head who would revive the family and had to bear the entirety of that heavy responsibility. I do not pretend to know the details of when or where Kenzo first met her. Guess it'd be rude to say any more than that. That was when Grandfather truly fell in love for the first time. Just how deep was his affection for her? That was just... That was easy to see just by looking around us. This room was covered in, with piles upon piles of things having to do with the black magic. And Grandfather spent every day shut in here, immersed in his research and isolated from the outside world, never regretting one minute of it. You couldn't help but recognize the depths of Grandfather's love for Beatrice. I... had it all wrong, Genji. What do you mean by that? I've always thought that maybe you servants believed blindly in the witch because you were influenced by grandfather's creepy hobby. But that's not how it is, right? By acting as though Beatrice's soul at least had been restored and, and existing inside this mansion, they might have hoped to soothe grandfather's heart. With closed eyes and the expression of one remembering something from the distant past, Genji had broken his long silence. In making that confession, he probably felt like he was betraying his one and only master in the most serious way, even though that person was already dead. Beatrice has revived as a witch, and she is in the mansion even now. Genji had said it, had believed it, had made people believe it, and would take that with him to the grave. This might have been the last service he could offer up to his master. The legend of the witch, the mysterious tale of Rock and Jima that was still whispered of amongst the servants. Its true nature was a sad lie. No, it was an act of kindness towards Grandfather, who had lost the person he loved above all else. I remember denying the witch's existence in front of Grandfather on multiple occasions. In front of father, now I finally understand how much that must have wounded him. Right now, I can understand very well. If I thought I could revive Shannon using black magic, I'd immediately become the next owner of this room and start researching. Aniki. Another strand of tears dripped from George's eyes. Maybe his tears were infectious. Tears rose to Jessica's eyes too and she sniffled. Beatrice has said it. Very soon, she will be able to revive people. You'll be able to meet them, she said. Very soon, the door to the Golden Land will be opened. In the promised land that glitters gold, the souls of all the dead will be resurrected along with the love that has been lost. Then I will sleep in a world of peacefulness for all time. Did she say that? The Beatrice who gave you the letter? You don't believe, do you? <laughs> if only Grandfather were here, I'm sure he'd be happy. I'm sure he'd be jumping for joy now that Beatrice is about to be revived. In that case, I believe. And Grandfather gave up half of his life for this research, trying to resurrect the soul of a woman he loved and spending the rest of his life believing, then I believe too. When you love a single woman for so long, the people around you catch on to it and it becomes a truth. Maybe you could say they're just being polite for the sake of your feelings. But right here, now, I'd like to call that magic. It isn't just being polite. It really is magic. She's a witch. It looks like no one can see Beatrice after all. Some time passed, as we listened to the sound of the rain, we considered what kind of love and madness must have possessed the owner of this room as he spent his half of his life here. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't crack on me. Don't crack on me. <laughs> if you ask me as a woman, then I'd like to be understanding of father's feelings of true love. It did leave mother in an... It did leave mother in an, in an awkward position. 
I agree. Cheating is cheating. No way to make it look pretty. Yeah, that's right. Gotta feel sorry for grandmother. So, have there been any rumors about a child between Beatrice and grandfather? The keyword Beatrice had been hidden in every corner of this case. So it's natural to suspect some relative of hers. No. I have not heard of anything like that. If there was one, a memento of his most beloved person, he surely would have given them all of his affection. Since he ended up immersing himself in black magic instead, maybe we should assume that there was no such child. Come to think of it, that reminds me of a rumor I heard. You know it, right? The story of how Grandfather heavily supported an orphanage called the Fukuin House? Enough of that. That is nothing more than slander which would desecrate Father. Tell us, Anasuhi. I think even you would agree that this is no time to hide things from each other. It's a worthless story. Father made massive donations to an orphanage and had the orphans employed as servants at the head family and, and to give them some on-the-job experience. The story in question is simply some dribble spread by fools who claim that father was using those orphans for some filthy hobby. For a while, some guys even said he was collecting human sacrifices for his black magic. And he really is doing weird experiments and ceremonies in this room all the time, so I have believed in myself. And these servants who came from the Fukuin house are... There are several of them. But Kanon and Shannon were the two... But Kanon and Shannon were the two scheduled during the family conference shift. To resurrect Beatrice, he brought in servants from an orphanage as human sacrifices. After all, everyone grandfather selected as a servant was young. About the same age as Shannon or Kanon. I was sure it was because Grandfather had some bizarre hobby. Mind your words! When on Natsui scolded her, the atmosphere instantly went sour and everyone felt quiet. However, something was tugging at the back of my mind. Sacrifices, sacrifices. Human sacrifices brought over from an orphanage. What is it? Freaky words like sacrifices don't pop up often. The epitaph, nigga! And yet, I've seen or heard that word recently. Some part of my memory is tugging at me. Hey, Beatrice, what do you know? I had arrived in front of the portrait of Beatrice. It wasn't as massive as the one in the entrance hall, but that portrait, which has been, which must have been drawn by some famous painter, was still just as intimidating in the smaller size. Below it, just like in the entrance hall, was the epitaph that supposedly hinted at the location of the hidden gold. Sacrifices. Here. What the hell, Battling? You're creeping me out. Six. Sacrifices. Let me get a sip of water, because I might have to get into a voice acting bag. Both of my eyes were wide as plates. Everything's been predicted right there from the very beginning. Everyone crowded around, and the same expression of shock rose to all of our faces. That's right. It's right there in the epitaph. When the first twilight offered the six chosen by the key as sacrifices. The key. The shutter key. Ah, uh, there's no doubt. Six people died in the beginning. And even on the shutter when the magic circle was drawn, no, where the Hebrew was mentioned, written and mentioned all the offering of sacrifices. I've been saying that from the beginning. That's right, Maria said it right at the start. Right after we found the six bodies, when Mario was in the parlor watching TV, she said it. Ooh, ooh, the corporate isn't human. It's just a sacrifice chosen by the key. 
This has nothing to do with the location of the hidden goal. It's the instructions for the resurrection ceremony using black magic or something. After all, this epitaph requires a large amount of deaths. It sure does. Even reading through it quickly, there'd be 6 plus 2 plus 5? 13 people who must die. How many people are normally on this island? It changes depending on the shifts with the servants. But there's my father, my husband, Jessica, and me. And two or three servants? Today and yesterday, there were five of them, but there aren't normally that many. Which means normally, there wouldn't be enough sacrifices to carry out this ceremony. No way. There's that rumor that grandfather was collecting servants from an orphanage to be used as sacrifices of a creepy ceremony. So what does this mean? He increased the number of servants to increase the number of sacrifices? And waited for the annual family conference when there were even more people would gather? Is it now the only time of the year this conference could be held? When Jessica screamed this, Mario broke out into that creepy laugh looking truly pleased. <laughs> Haven't you ever heard of people making bets to test their faith? Like throwing a sandal and saying that if it lands right side up, tomorrow will be sunny. Or saying that tomorrow will be a good day if a coin lands heads up. There are many little superstitions like that. Sometimes when your luck is down and you get bored, and you roll the dice, he gets three sixes. You want to believe it's a portent or of some kind of miracle. When flipping a sandal, you have at worst a 50% chance. Even if you get it right side up, it's not worth much. But if you carelessly roll three dice and they all come up six, you might think that it's some small miracle. Magic works the same way. You must pray earnestly for an extremely unlikely result. Then the feelings from all those stored up prayers gain magical power and become incarnate. The magic that grandfather was trying to perform was probably like that. The key randomly selected sacrifices in a lottery. So to reduce the chance that he, that he himself was selected, he chose a day to the greatest number of people on the island to carry out the ceremony. Ridiculous! Are you saying that this entire situation was caused by a mere ceremony for some bizarre magic? Natsui yelled. She couldn't quite she couldn't quell the fear that a scorpion chain might be the only reason she was still alive. If if I hadn't received that charm from Jessica and hung it from my doorknob, would I have been killed, mixed in with along with those six? And the strangest part is, even though I hung the charm from the inside of my door. They couldn't get through that door. The culprit noticed a charm from outside the door and gave up trying to open it. A human couldn't have perceived that. A charm meant to stop something that was not human had done exactly that. Impossible, impossible, impossible! But Natsuhi, the epitaph certainly does continue to fit even after that. On the second twilight, those who remain shall tear apart the two that who are close. Could this be talking about Ava and Hideyoshi? Painful as it may be, we must reach that conclusion. And after the culprit killed them, they left the words from the third twilight in a letter there. That, that's right. After carrying out the second twilight, they left the third twilight in that place. The third twilight was just like Aunt Natsui had read. On the third twilight, those who remain shall praise my noble name. Ah, uh, if you read it this way, it just keeps going on, doesn't it? On the fourth twilight, gouge the head and kill. Gouge the head and kill. George's parents were killed with those demon ice picks gouging into their heads. But if they were the second twilight, then Kenzo was the fourth! Then someone else must have been gouged in the head. That's grandfather. He was burned in the incinerator and our eyes were so drawn to that part that we didn't notice. But his forehead, no, his head had been gouged. Grandfather was the victim of the fourth twilight. Then Kanon was, on the fifth twilight, gouge the chest and kill. 
We thought Kana's case was an unexpected encounter with the culprit, but that's wrong. From the very beginning, they plan to lure someone out alone and drive something into their chest. If the culprit followed the epitaph this far, does that mean three people still have to die? On the sixth twilight, gouge the stomach and kill. On the seventh, gouge the knee and kill. On the eighth, gouge the leg and kill. Yes. You you could read it that way. Well, I wonder about that. After those three die, it reaches the ninth twilight. Take a look. On the ninth twilight, the witch shall revive and none shall be left alive. We're all going to be killed by Beatrice. I don't get it. What did that mean? Everyone dies no matter how many people there are? What was Grandfather after? Doesn't this mean a ceremony would kill him too no matter what? It's okay if no one's left alive. On the 10th twilight, we finally arrive at the Golden Land. On the 10th twilight, a journey's in. You shall attain the power of the Golden Land's treasures once and for the last time. The witch shall praise the wise and bestow four treasures. Grandfather wasn't afraid of dying. Look at the second and third of the four. Look at the second and third of the four treasures. One shall be the resurrection, resurrection of all the dead souls. One shall be the resurrection of the love that was lost. So grandfather believed that he would eventually be revived, even if he died part way through this ceremony. Ridiculous, that's insane. When you die, it's over, right? The dead don't come back to life? Isn't that what a, isn't that a miracle humanity's been chasing after for thousands of years and still haven't accomplished? So is this what it means? Something like you'll be able to meet them in the afterlife or they'll be restored? And that's what you're saying right now, would that mean that Grandfather, whose remaining life is slim, who's been driven mad by love, is committing suicide? No. A massive forced group suicide. Kenji, is such a thing possible? I don't know. The Master is a man who sometimes has the wisdom to see a thousand years into the future. However, there are times when that appears to be nothing more than madness to commoners such as myself. Okay, should we take that as a yes? What do you say, Kumasawa? I don't know anything. That's right, I don't know. Do you think I would be on this island today if I did know? I would have faked an illness and done something to take a day off, that's right. What's, what about your opinion, Dr. Nanjo? You've been grandfather's friend for many years. I feel the same as Genji. Kinzo was a man who far surpassed ordinary people. I even felt a sort of inhuman power from him sometimes. Even I don't know what Kinzo was thinking when he wrote that epitaph. All we can say is that even if Father did write this script, someone else is carrying it out. That's right. At the very least, there's another culprit who attacked Grandfather and Kanon. Furthermore, that person is still committing the crimes just as the epitaph says. The letter in the beginning that we didn't think deeply about. What was it? What was it that was written there? We thought back to the recitation of the letter last night. Beatrice had proclaimed something inside it. She had proclaimed, according to her contract with Kenzo, she would collect everything of the Ushurimiya family's interest. But she also revealed a special clause. If someone discovered the location of the gold Grandfather had hidden, that right would be lost. When the letter was read, Grandfather was still alive. But at that time, it had already been sealed with the wax of the head's ring. Which meant Grandfather had handed the ring over to Beatrice while he was still alive. If we take a straightforward approach, Maybe we should assume Beatrice is carrying out that single contract with Grandfather guaranteeing her that right. In other words, this was the same as Grandfather of saying as it was the same as saying Grandfather knew and approved of the content of that letter. In other words, it's basically a joint message from Beatrice and Grandfather 
telling us that Beatrice will start collecting interest if we don't solve the riddle. In other words, Grandfather and Beatrice were demanding that we try to solve the riddle of the epitaph. And if we couldn't, they were saying that a massacre would be carried out in the court carried out according to the epitaph. What does that mean? What do they want? I don't have a clue what it means. Look, another letter from Beatrice. Huh? What did you say? Mario was pointing at the top of the table where the canned food everyone had been eating just now still lay. A western envelope from Beatrice certainly was sitting there. But so what? What in the- Aunt Natsui let out a hysterical cry, looking between her own hand and the table. Because the envelope she had just opened was still grasping her hand. So why is there still an envelope on the table? <laughs> yeah, nigga, the witch exists! The witch is real! The witch is real! Accept it! Like, y'all better start praising her motherfucking name! Because she's about to turn this bitch up! Like, oh my goodness! The witch is real, my nigga! Y'all better start apologizing. Y'all better get those scorpion keychains. Y'all better get on y'all hands and knees and beg for uh, and beg forgiveness. Beg forgiveness of me. Like y'all y'all better be Chris Brown and start begging, nigga. What the hell? What's going on, Maria? Where did that envelope come from? Just now I looked and it was lying there. Don't do that fake ass, uh. I don't know anything, anything! This isn't funny! There's only eight of us here! There's no way some ninth person snuck in! There wasn't enough time during the few seconds that we gathered around the portrait, right? It might have been the witch gang. Shit! Oh shit! Get back, all of you! Back against the wall! Anatsui was pointing the rifle at Genji and the others, bellowing at them. Genji was overpowered, his face looking like he didn't have a clue what was going on. Of course I felt the same, but a few moments later I reached the same conclusion Anatsui had. Until a few seconds ago, there had been no letter like this on the table, and nobody entered this room. That means someone among us placed it there during the few seconds when everyone was looking away, preoccupied with the portrait. Battler! Open the envelope and read what's inside. Sure. I picked it up. It was still sealed with wax. Even without disturbing its contents, I realized that this was an as yet unopened envelope, an unknown envelope. Without relying on paper knife, I tore it open and pulled out the letter inside. The contents were as follows. Are you enjoying the riddle of Kenzo's epitaph? As you are all probably aware, you have very little time remaining. Please, abandon any naive hopes of escaping after the storm passes. This game can only win with my victory or yours. When time runs out, I will win by default. There will be no ties. Make sure that you do not understand your current situation. That's what it says. It isn't clear who put this letter here. However, I've been able to narrow down the list of suspects. It's you all! Madam, this is just too horrible. Just before I moved to the- just, be, just before I moved towards the portrait, I set the can of food down here. At that time, there definitely wasn't anything as strange as this letter here. And at that time, Jessica and Battler were all running in front of the portrait. And they didn't leave the spot in front of the portrait until the letter opened, appeared. So the person who set that letter down is one of you four. Beatrice is here. We aren't Beatrice. Beatrice exists. Shut the fuck up. I don't know whether I should suspect one of you or all of you. But without a doubt, at least one among you is the culprit. Th that's right. There can't be a 19th person. There's no way witches exist. Even when Kano was killed. Yeah. That could be explained if Kumasawa was the one who did it. The truth is that Kumasawa entered the boiler room and killed him. And then she lied saying she had already, he had already fallen when she got there. You're making a mistake, milady. Why would I do something like that? 
I don't have the slightest idea how my parents were killed in that closed room. But when they were killed, everyone except the servants had an alibi. The only ones who didn't, who weren't, the only ones who didn't were the servants. But does that really mean it's okay to suspect them? Yes, yeah, now that you mention it, they don't have enough they have no alibi for any of the cases. Would really be so quick to make that judgment. But this time, in this room, in this place, in this moment, in this minimally small bit of time and space, it's obvious. Only only one of the four of them could have set the letter there in our blind spot. We can't tell who put it there, but it's obvious one of the four did it. Natsui! Please, calm yourself! A lot has happened today! I understand now how much strain is put on your mind right now! Dr. Nanjo, it truly pains me to call you suspicious. However, you are father's personal doctor and his closest friend. You have been by his side for many years, and you might even know about Beatrice. Could you be hiding something of- Could you be hiding some kind of old obligation? Of course not! Calm yourself! It was pitiful to watch Dr. Nanjo frantically pleading his innocence. It was probably a normal reaction that anyone would give if they were suspected. Kumasawa was the same. Ever since Jessica voiced her suspicions of Kumasawa murdering Kanon, Kumasawa had been totally flustered. That was why Genji's still calm appearance looked so bold. Unnatsui pointed the barrel of the gun. Genji, you were grandfather's number one subordinate. Was Beatrice an illusion you showed the father with you as the performer? <coughs> if by suspecting me you recognize me as Master's greatest servant, then I count it as a great honor regardless of the circumstances. However, I am not the one who put the letter there. Do you expect us to just accept that? You must be the ringleader! Maybe Kumasawa and Dr. Nanjo are your accomplices! And Maria too! Damn! Not content to suspect just the adults, Unnatsui pointed the gun relentlessly at Maria too. But Maria acted as though nothing had happened. Or maybe she thought she would be fine even if she was shot. Maria. By this point, we can no longer remove someone from suspicion just because they're young. So for the last time, let me ask the question that everyone has had since last night. Yesterday, who was the Beatrice that handed you that letter? Maria, don't dodge the question! Make it clear! Who gave you that letter? How many times do I have to tell you? It's Beatrice, the thousand-year-old golden witch. If you want to know what she looks like, just turn around. See, she's right there. Beatrice is. Don't mess with us, Maria! Enough, Jessica! Maria, too. Don't you understand the situation? What are you hoping to gain by saying stuff like that? Stop stirring each other up pointlessly. I don't understand. Who did you all want the culprit to be? You only believe in Beatrice when you don't want to suspect one of your own. When you're trying to settle a grudge because someone who's close to you has been killed, only then do you want to believe in a human you can attack with violence and deny Beatrice. That's why you can't see her. Beatrice exists. You all can't see her. Silence! I don't want to label you as the culprit, but there is no longer any doubt that you enjoy making the situation unpleasant and are providing assistance to the enemy. <laughs> then what will you do? Shoot me? I don't mind. Very soon the doors of the Golden Land will be open. Then all the dead will be resurrected. Right now, death is nothing to be afraid of. Mom, she really gets suspicious. We can't keep her with us. But Anatsui, please calm down. There's no reason to shoot Maria. Please remain composed. The letter was meant to provoke us, but it's nothing to be afraid of. Even the culprit is scared of what will happen tomorrow. They're scared of the police. 
Right, right now, this island is free from the reach of the law, but that's only because it's isolated by this typhoon. Once the typhoon passes, the law will return. So you mustn't shoot. How can you stay so calm, George? One of these four is the culprit. No, maybe all four of them are working together. How can you stay so calm when one of these four might be the culprit who killed your parents? Even I have the desire to find the culprit and kill them. But that would be simple barbarism. I will leave the judgment of crimes to the law. So no matter how suspicious they are, you mustn't pull that trigger. I feel the same as George. i Natsui. Get a hold of yourself for a second. Anyway, it'd be bad to shoot. In times like this, I hear you should lift your head back and say, stay cool three times. Let me make this clear. Witches don't exist. Not on Rock and Jima, not in the Ushiramiya Mansion. I declare it as Ushiramiya Natsuhi, representative of the Ushiramiya family. There's no witch here. I won't accept Beatrice. No matter, no matter what you're planning, I won't let you lay one finger on my daughter or the rest of them. That's my duty as a mother and as representative to the family. Those words were the final f words of farewell that settled everything. To protect her daughter, Anatsu would regard any suspicious per any suspicious person as an enemy. The only reason George and I were standing on this side was because, by coincidence, we had a clear alibi regarding the letter. If I hadn't approached the portrait, I would also be on the other end of that gun barrel, treated like a criminal. But even though part of me had thought that, part of me was thinking that chasing all the suspicious people from this room would finally guarantee our safety. Genji and Kumasawa and Dr. Nanjo, all of them were on Grandfather's side. Maybe you could say that once Mario started blindly believing in Beatrice, she was also on Grandfather's side. That's right, they're all suspicious. But is this really okay? If we throw out all of the suspicious ones in, the, in such a lawless way, will we still have the right to defy the lawlessness of the witch? Don't break glass on me. Don't break glass on me. Don't do that. Don't break glass on me. Or if you're going to break glass on me, don't do it so suddenly to where it scares me. Uh, not so we didn't tell them to leave with their own words. But with wordless pressure, she induced them to say that themselves. Because if Dr. Nanzo didn't say those words... This cold silence will surely continue forever. Calm yourself, Natsuhi. Still, I understand your feelings well. I myself feel like there's been something wrong with my head after all these strange repeated incidents. So I understand why, well why you want to suspect us. If you really have nothing to do with this, then my actions now would be beyond rude. However, please understand just this once. Very well. Let's leave the room. What do you say, Genji? Shall we return to the parlor and continue our chess game? If that is what you wish, by all means. I... I don't want to! After all, that means we'll have to leave this room and knowing the wolf is among us, right? I don't want to, madam. Please forgive me! It was obvious what Kumasawa was trying to say. If she was innocent, then she was being ejected into dangerous territory along with the culprit. In the current situation, urging her to leave this room along with the suspects was almost exactly the same as letting her get killed. However, Kumasawa really was suspicious just for being the first to discover that Kanan had been murdered. At that time, everyone but Kumasawa had an alibi. Unless we can prove the existence of some contraption or existence of some 19th person, Kumasawa was by far the most likely suspect. I didn't want to believe it. However, Aunt Natsuhi and the rest of us were in such a difficult situation that we couldn't help suspecting her as well. So we didn't say anything to stop Aunt Natsuhi from trying to oppressively chase them from the room. We had stopped her from shooting. We were passively agreeing to chase the others out of that room. On top of that, Maria spoke to the fretful Kumasawa. It's okay. Beatrice is kind to of those who respect her. 
You believe that Beatrice exists. So it'll definitely be okay. I'll watch TV in the parlor. Let's watch it together. It's so boring here without TV. It looked like Kumasawa found Maria's roguish laugh very frightening. However, the other three had agreed to leave the room. Kumasawa couldn't fight the flow and had to agree, crying as she went. Damn. Not my nigga Kumasawa. Well then, Natsuhi. That will be all for tonight. Let us meet again tomorrow. Yes. Please understand, at least for tonight. When the police come, all of us will surely apologize for our rudeness. You may play chess, but do it in a safe place if you can. Genji, I leave them in your hands. Certainly. It, it can't be helped, can it? They always say that the most frightening bears are those with their children. Genji, Kumasawa, my sincere apologies. Let us meet again tomorrow. Maria, too. Please forgive your cold aunt. I forgive you. Madam, the key is to this room. I will hand both over to you. Genji pulled two golden keys from his pocket and handed them to An Natsuhi. And I will also hand over my bundle of keys to the inside of the mansion. He took out a bundle of about ten keys of various shapes and handed it over. To the servants, these keys were probably proof of their position. Being placed in charge of those keys meant that they were trusted, relied upon. When they were forced to return them, it meant they had lost that trust. Thinking about it this way, to Genji, who had worked here for a span of many years, there could be no greater shame. However, Genji's usual indifferent expression remained on his face. Genji, I had planned that. After father passed away, I would reward you for your many years of hard work and allow you to retire. To treat you like this makes me feel ashamed from the bottom of my heart. I have already received the master's favor. Everything I have done until today has been in repayment for that. Please do not worry over it. Well then, shall we everyone? Good night to you all. Good night! Good night to you too, Battle Good night to you too, Battle Ah, uh, Maria. Wait a sec. Knowledge of guilt made me call Maria back. I groped around in my pocket and took out that scorpion keychain. This repels magic, right? Wear it. Didn't you say you dropped it? Back then, I got ticked off and just blessed that I and just bluffed that I lost it. There's no way I'd lose the precious charm you gave me. Maria silently took a charm. I was unable to say anything after that. Well then, everyone. Good night to you. We watched them leave, our expressions completely worn out, and we weren't even able to respond. That's fucked. Shit makes me sad. Until the door closed and we heard the auto lock, we were unable to breathe. Then we were finally allowed to take a breath. After that, I noticed Beatrice's letter which I had been gripping the whole time, which was soaked in my sweat, actually had two sheets. The paper had been tightly stuck together, so I mistakenly thought that there was only one. There was no characters on the second sheet. The thing drawn there was a magic circle, written with a red ink like blood. Just like how the, every magic circle up until then had been different, this magic circle was one I never laid eyes on before. Inside the circle, a large triangle, and a small triangle will fit together in a simple design. Just as before, there was writing in Hebrew. It seemed clear that it held some kind of meaning. I wanted to know what that could be, but we had just chased Maria, the only person who could understand the meaning of his magic circles out of the room. I thought of his magic circle as Beatrice's second message. What does this magic circle mean? Damn it! 
After chasing out all the suspicious people, all we have to do is stay barricaded here until morning, and everything will probably be over. Once the typhoon is passed, when the seagulls cry, will everything be resolved? But the letter, which had unexpectedly appeared in the study, forced us to reject that naivety. It had made it very clear that if time ran out, it would mean the witch's victory. When time runs out, is the witch planning to take on the offense? This time, is she planning to display some fearful magical power? Maybe something that could have been used to kill six adults at once? Wait, when is time supposed to run out anyway? I don't know anything. With this, I should finally be safe. Finally. Definitely. Even as she said that, our knots we couldn't stop gripping that rifle. There was no relief release in the tension of her expression. Of course, none of us felt like si felt like breathing a sigh of relief. At least not until we heard the cry of the seagulls once more. Don't crack on me. It's gonna crack on me. I fucking knew it. Damn, why are you so up close and personal? Back the fuck up, bitch! Oh, shit. I, I ain't like how... I didn't like how we're doing that. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoy, like, subscribe, leave a comment, or read them all. Tap into the next one. Damn. I'm not gonna lie. That shit was heart-wrenching. Shit like, you know, just... I always say this, but like, good... I, I know I said this in a few games I played. Not gonna say which ones in case of spoilers. But goodbyes and goodbyes always fuck me up, like, emotionally. And distrust always fucks me up too. Like when you just got a bunch of people who fuck with each other, but can't trust each other, that always like really fucking bothers me and like hurts my heart. So like this whole chapter, like really fucked with me a lot. I'm not gonna lie to you, man. But damn, I assume next episode will be the last one. That's my assumption. I'll probably be recording that today as well because I'm locked the fuck in on this game. But peace out, I love y'all. Hope y'all are enjoying, man. I'm so glad I got into visual novels. Real shit.